Section 3.8 deals with auctions. And just to set the context, so far we have talked about the market forces of demand and supply helping set the equilibrium price. Auctions are also a way of setting equilibrium price and that's what we'll talk about over here. First, two broad categories of auctions. One is a common value auction and number two, we can also have private value auction. So with the common value auction, the value of the item is the same to all bidders, but may be unknown. So if you think about this big jar, which is full of coins in the US context, let's say that we have a jar full of quarters. And I ask you to bid for this particular jar. Notice that the value will be the same to all the bidders, but the value is not known for sure. When something like this happens, we say we have a common value auction. A private value auction is where the value of the item is specific to each bidder. So if we take a couple of sports examples, let's say the bat with which Sachin Tandulkar scored his hundredth hundred. Now clearly the value of that particular bat will be different for different bidders. Or to use a US example, let's say the bat with which Barry Bonds broke the record for the most number of home runs in a season. Now clearly the value of that bat is going to be different for different bidders. So that would be a private value auction. Now coming to the different auction mechanisms. The most basic kind of a mechanism is a ascending price mechanism, which is also called a English auction. And you might have seen this in, in a regular auction house where the auctioneer puts out a price and then bidders keep bidding and the price keeps going up and the highest bidder gets the item. So that's a simple ascending price auction also called an English auction. A sealed bid auction is where all the bidders submit sealed bids and the other bidders do not know what the other bid prices are. So in this case, the bidders don't know what the other bid prices are. The highest bidder would then get the product. So that's a sealed bid auction. The issue with a sealed bid auction is the fair that I might be bidding too much. So if a particular bidder bids a thousand and the next highest bidder has bid 400, then the danger here is, or the issue is that this particular person, if he finds out later, he will not be too happy because he could have bid 401 and gotten the same item. Now, because of this, the bidders might hold back and not put the entire amount that they might be willing to pay. To deal with this, there is a concept of a second price sealed bid, also called a Vickery auction, where the bids are still sealed and the highest bidder gets the item, but only needs to pay the amount equal to the second highest bid. So that way, the winner does not have to worry about the fact that he overpaid a lot. If he is willing to pay a thousand, he can put in thousand with the knowledge that ultimately he will only have to pay an amount equal to the second highest bid. Note that the second highest bidder will not get the product. The product will still go to the highest bidder. Finally, we come to Dutch auctions, which are descending price auctions. And here, the lowest bidder gets the product or the service. And just to give you a simple example, if a company wants to outsource a given project and the company approaches three firms, A, B, and C, the project is clearly defined, then obviously 
if A, B, and C are all going to produce the same quality when delivering the project, then the decision comes down to price and the lowest bidder would get the project. So this would be an example of a Dutch auction. If a company is auctioning lots of products or lots of projects, then there might be a case where A might take up a certain number of projects at a certain price and then if there are more projects to hand out, the next bidder will take a few more projects and so on. Finally, we come to Dutch auctions, which are descending price auctions. And these are used often in finance. We are going to discuss a few examples. But simplistically, when companies do a stock buyback, that would be a Dutch auction where obviously the companies would want to buy back at the lowest possible price. Also, when the Treasury issues T-bills, it will want to issue T-bills at the lowest discount rate. In a Dutch auction where different bidders get different prices, that would be called a multi-price Dutch auction. But mostly what we see in finance are single price Dutch auctions. So let's go through a few examples now. Here is a classic one. A company wants to buy back 3 million shares and offers to buy back at a price between 26 and 28. The current price is 25. As I mentioned before, the company would want to buy back at a price that is as low as possible. Say we have the following bidders. Bidder 1 says, that he will sell 2 million shares at 26. Bidder 2 says that he will sell 3 million shares at 27. And Bidder 3 says that he will sell back to the company 4 million shares at 28. Now, what will the company do? Obviously, the company would like to buy back at the lowest possible price of 26. So as far as bidder one is concerned, 2 million shares are covered. Then the company will go to bidder two, but here bidder two is willing to sell 3 million shares. Company, the company will only buy back 1 million. Once the company buys back 1 million shares, the overall allocation of 3 million is complete. In my example, I'm going based on number of shares, but the more realistic scenario is where the company says that it wants this much dollar worth of shares back. The concept, however, doesn't change. What will happen over here, if we have a single price auction, then the price will be set at 27 because only at a price of 27 will the company be able to buy back 3 million shares. But at a price of 27, only one third of this particular request will be filled. So if you have a particular bidder who's saying that he will sell back 3 million shares, of those 3 million shares, the company will only buy back 1 million. Whereas the bidder who said that he will sell back 2 million shares will be able to sell all 2 million shares to the company. This is an example of a single price Dutch auction. Take another example. Let's say the Treasury announces that it will auction six month T-bills with a face value of 100 million. We have non-competitive bids worth 10 million. This means that the bidder is saying that no matter what the final price, they are going to purchase T-bills with a face value of 10 million. So these are called non-competitive bids. The question is, what is the winning price given the following competitive bids? So from bidder one, the bid is 2%. And if you have studied quant already, you will recognize that T-bills are quoted based on a discount rate. And a particular discount rate corresponds to a particular price. But we will focus on the discount rate. So the first bidder says that he is bidding 
2% and these are normally banks or institutions. So institution 1 says that it is bidding a 2% rate and the face value is 40. Bank 2 is bidding 2.2%, face value is 30. This is bidder 3 and this is bidder 4. Now what is the price at which the treasury will finally auction? The total value is 100 million. Of this 100 million, 10 million are competitive bids, which leaves us with 90 million. If you look at these numbers now, and you come up with the cumulative numbers, 40 from here, and then another 30 takes us to 70. Another 30 here would take us all the way to 100. But we only want to be at 90. So the final price is going to be 2.4% because this is a single price auction and that is the price at which all the amount can be taken care of or this is the amount at which 100 million value of T-bills can be issued or sold by the treasury. Bidder 1 has the entire order filled. Bidder 2 will also have the entire order filled. But with Bidder 3, Bidder 3 wanted to buy securities with a face value of 30 million, but will only be able to buy securities with a face value of 20 million because with 20 million, that is where we get up to 90. So 40 plus 30 plus 20 will get us to 90. With bidder 3, two-thirds of the order or 66.67% will be filled. Bidder 4 will not get anything because he is trying to get a discount rate that is too high and the treasury will achieve its objective when it works with the first three or the best three bidders. Now you need to do example eight from the curriculum, which is essentially a similar example. It just uses a lot more numbers. Section 3.9, consumer surplus. And the title tells us what is consumer surplus. It is value minus expenditure. Before we get into this in detail, let's just review a few concepts. What is value and specifically what is marginal value? Value is the value that a consumer derives when he or she consumes a particular product. So if you are extremely thirsty, the value of the first cold drink that you purchase and consume will be relatively high. The value of the second cold drink is going to be lower. Marginal value refers to the value that you derive or the pleasure that you derive by consuming one more unit of the product. Another way of looking at it is value is what you would be willing to pay for a particular unit. So if we are talking about cold drinks, for the first cold drink, you would probably be willing to pay a fair amount. For the second one, you would be willing to pay a somewhat lower amount. So since this is the amount that you are willing to pay, the marginal value can also be thought of as the demand curve. Or if you go back to the definition of the demand curve, you will recognize that the demand curve can also be considered a marginal value curve. So in this context, we are going to say that the demand curve is the same as the marginal value curve. Now coming to consumer surplus. So as we've said before, consumer surplus is value minus expenditure. Let's say that for the first drink, you are willing to pay 100, but the price of that drink is 60. So how much value do you derive? You only pay 60 because that is the expenditure. The value then is 100 minus 60, which is 40. Let's say that the value that you derive from the second drink is 90. The expenditure, though, is still going to be 60. So the value is right here. That also is consumer surplus. So what is the overall consumer surplus? The overall consumer surplus is this shaded region. 
and notice that it is the area under the demand curve minus this region that I have crossed in red. The region in red is the expenditure. If you buy this quantity Q1 at a price P1, that is the total expenditure. And this total area under the curve is the total value. The green region, therefore, is the consumer surplus. If you look at this from the overall market perspective, and you say this is the market demand curve, then the market demand curve represents the value to the consumers. This part in red represents the cost or the expenditure incurred by consumers, and the green region would be the benefit or the consumer surplus. Here now is the sort of question that you might get on the exam. You will be given the market demand curve. So let's say that this curve is given by 240 minus 2P. That is your market demand. If price is equal to 40, what is the consumer surplus? In other words, you are given the price if price is equal to 70, what is the consumer surplus? So you are given the curve, you are given the price. What you need to do is find the area of this triangle. And you have studied this, I'm sure. The area of the triangle is half times the base times the height. So let's do the calculation. Here is a simple way of solving the problem. Recognize that when the quantity is zero, so if you plug in market demand zero, that is the y-axis, what is the price? You plug in zero over here, 240 minus 2p is zero, which means p must be 120 over here. Then you plug in a price of 70 and see what is the quantity. When p is 70, then the quantity is 100, 240 minus 70 into 2. So this point is 100. Now you have all the coordinates. The base is 100. This height over here is 120 minus 70, which is 50. The area of the triangle is half into base, 100 into height, 50. You do the calculation and you should get 2500. Now do example 9, which tests this concept. Coming now to producer surplus, which is revenue minus variable cost. We've talked about marginal cost before. Marginal cost is the cost of producing an additional unit. If you think about it, let's say that the cost of producing an additional unit is 10. Then a firm will sell that item for at least 10. If the cost of producing the next unit is 11, then the firm will sell for at least 11. This shows the firm's willingness to sell the product at a given price. Therefore, we can think of the supply curve as the marginal cost curve. Just like we thought about the demand curve earlier as the marginal benefit curve, we can think of the supply curve as the marginal cost curve. Now coming to producer surplus. Imagine that based on supply and demand, the equilibrium price of a given product is 150. And say that the first item can be produced at 100. This distance then represents a benefit to the producer. It is the producer surplus because the producer can sell for 150 an item which costs 150 to produce. The next item, say, is produced for 110, but the selling price again is 150. So that is the producer surplus or the producer benefit. If we add all this up, we have the producer surplus. So this region in pink is the producer surplus. And here, if you think about the overall industry, you have all the firms which are producing, or actually we should say the overall market. 
So all the firms are producing, say this is the marginal cost curve for the firms in the industry. This is how much they will sell for. This represents the variable cost, the region below the curve. The producer surplus then becomes the revenue, which is price into quantity. So this overall rectangle minus the region that I have shaded over here, the variable cost, the difference gives us the producer surplus. You might be asked to calculate the producer surplus and the calculation will be similar to what we saw earlier. You will have to do half base into height. So you could define this as the base, this as the height and do the calculation. This concept is covered in example 10. I'm not doing the calculation here because it is exactly similar to what we saw on the previous slide. Total surplus is the total value, which is the area below the demand curve or the marginal benefit curve minus the total variable cost, which is the area under the supply curve or the marginal cost curve. The other way of looking at it is that the total surplus is equal to the consumer surplus, which is the area in green, plus the producer surplus, which is this area in pink. You need to remember and recognize the fact that markets maximize society's total surplus. Total surplus, again, being the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus. When you have a free market, then the price and quantity is determined by the intersection of the supply curve and the demand curve. And notice that in this picture, the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus is maximized if a price and quantity is given by this intersection point. If for some reason we move somewhere else where Let's say we are over here at this point, a lower quantity, for example, then a certain amount of surplus is lost because if you think about this point, moving to the right would increase both the consumer surplus as well as the producer surplus. So this point is not very efficient. If you move to the right, then you have a situation where the marginal cost so the cost of producing an additional unit is more than the benefit of consuming that additional unit. So here again, there is a loss to society. In a simplistic example, therefore, all you need to remember is that society's benefit or the total surplus is maximized at this point, which is where supply and demand intersect. I don't think you need to get into too much detail here, but some products have positive externalities and others have negative externalities. When this happens, then our analysis becomes a little complicated. And I'll give you a high level example and then leave it at that. Say our service is education. With education, there is a certain cost, but there is also a benefit. The benefit, however, has externalities. The benefit of education is considerable and it might not be easy to capture that benefit in a simple demand curve or marginal benefit curve. So our analysis will have to be made a little more elaborate. Negative externalities exist with products such as tobacco, or you might also have negative externalities associated with pollution. There, the actual cost to society would be more than what might simply be depicted by a simple supply curve. So all we'll say at this stage is that if there are externalities, then they also should be considered in our analysis. Coming now to market interference, there is a negative impact on total surplus if there is interference in the market. And we are going to talk here about price ceilings, price flows, and taxes. Let's start with a price ceiling. A classic price ceiling is rent controls. With a ceiling, there is a ceiling set on price. And a classic example of a ceiling is a 
rent control in a given region. If the ceiling is above the equilibrium price, then the ceiling has no effect because the equilibrium price will be over here and if it is below the ceiling, then the ceiling has no effect. However, if a ceiling is set below the equilibrium price, then we have an issue because let's say that the equilibrium price is 100 and a ceiling is set at 80. At a price of 80, a supplier will only be willing to supply this quantity. Let's say that this quantity is 50 and let's say that the equilibrium quantity would have been 66. Now, this quantity is obviously less than what we would have in equilibrium. At a quantity of 50, the price that consumers are willing to pay is quite high. Let's say that this price is 150. So we are stuck over here. Some consumers will benefit a lot because they will get the product for only 80, even though they are consumers who are willing to pay 150. In this situation, we have what is called a dead weight loss, which is this region that has been shaded. Dead weight loss is a measure of inefficiency. If this area is large, that means the inefficiency is more. The dead weight loss is coming because this area that used to be part of the consumer surplus no longer exists. So we are losing consumer surplus. And this area, the bottom part of the deadweight loss, used to be producer surplus, but producers are not getting that benefit anymore because we are stuck at this level. Now, what producer surplus is left? If producers can only sell for 80, then this is what is left of the producer surplus. And this region here seems to be the new consumer surplus. So in the past, the consumer surplus was above this red line. Now, in theory, it seems like the consumers have benefited a little bit or the surplus has gone up. But if you think about it, consumers will have to incur a lot of search costs. Some might be lucky enough to get the product for 80 but consumers will be running around and searching and obviously there is a cost associated with searching and that cost is called search cost. So some of that consumer surplus will be eaten up by the search cost. On the right, we take a look at a price flow. A classic example of a price flow is minimum wage. Let's say that the equilibrium wage for unskilled labor is $6 and the government imposes a minimum wage. If the minimum wage is below the equilibrium point, then the minimum wage will not have any impact because minimum wage means that the wage must be above the minimum. However, if the minimum wage is above equilibrium, then we will have a problem. If the minimum wage is set, for example, at 7, then the demand for laborers is going to be given by this point over here. Let's say that this point is 100. The equilibrium demand at a price of 6, let's say, would have been 120. But now the demand is 100. At a higher wage of 7, which is the minimum wage, the supply is going to be more. So let's say that the supply is 140. An obvious issue we have here is that of unemployment. At a wage of 7 or a wage rate of 7, the supply of labor far exceeds the demand. So that creates an issue. Also notice that if we are stuck at this point, then again we have a dead weight loss, which is this region. Because as far as the firms are concerned, they are going to only hire 100 or the quantity is 100. This part of the dead weight loss is the loss in consumer surplus. 
and this part at the bottom is the loss in producer surplus. If we are at this point, then the consumer surplus now is this region and the region over here is the producer surplus. But overall note that the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus is less than what it would be if we had the equilibrium price. Now I want you to do example 11 where you are given the equation for the demand curve, you are given the equation for the supply curve, you are given a price flow and are asked to calculate the dead weight loss which would be the area of this triangle. You can use this as the base and this as the height and the area of the triangle would be half base into height. On this slide, we will consider the impact of a per unit tax. On the left hand side, we see what happens when there is a per unit tax on buyers. In other words, the law is saying that whenever a consumer buys a product, he pays a certain amount of tax. Let's say the tax amount is T. Before the tax, we have a particular demand curve and a particular supply curve. And to make this analysis easier, let us use some numbers. Before the tax is imposed, say the equilibrium price in the market is 100 and the equilibrium quantity is 200. When the tax is imposed, what is happening is the following. The demand curve effectively shifts down. If you think about it, at a quantity of 200, if the consumer pays 100, out of that 100, a certain amount T, let's say that that T is equal to 10, goes to the government. And what the supplier gets or the amount that is actually paid in the market is 100 minus 10, which is 90. The supplier still has the same supply curve, but clearly this point is not the equilibrium point. The equilibrium point or the new equilibrium point after the tax of 10 has been imposed is now this point over here. Let's say that this point is point X. And if this is the new price, let's say that this new price is 95. Then the amount that is paid is actually 105 because the tax amount is 10. If the supplier is getting or receiving 95, the consumer actually wants to pay or the consumer needs to pay 95 plus 10, which is 105. The question now is whether the tax has introduced any inefficiency or whether any deadweight loss has been created. And the answer is yes, because if you look at the situation before the tax, our total surplus, consumer surplus plus producer surplus, was given by this overall big red triangle. Now, with the imposition of taxes, we have this situation where the consumer is paying 95, the government is getting 10, and the firm or the seller is getting 95. So we are now over here at a quantity that is less than 200. The consumer is paying more than the original price of 100. So the consumer is paying 105 and the supplier is getting 95. This solid red area is dead weight loss. Part of the dead weight loss is coming from the original consumer surplus and part of it is coming from the original producer surplus. The next scenario we look at is where the tax is paid by the seller. Let's say we have a similar situation where originally before the tax is imposed, our equilibrium point is given by a price of 100 and a quantity of 200. If the tax needs to be paid by the seller or the supplier, and let's say the tax amount is again 10, then we have this sort of a situation. At a quantity of 200, 
the seller will sell for ten dollars more ten dollars being the tax because as far as the seller is concerned ten will go straight to the government and the seller will then sell for or the seller will effectively get hundred this point does not represent an equilibrium mark so we need to come down here this now is the new equilibrium the original point over here is 110 the price will be less than 110 say this point over here is 105 that is how much the consumer will need to pay and the seller will get 105 minus 10 which is 95 so notice that whether the buyer pays the tax or the seller pays the tax in both cases the buyer or the consumer is paying 105 the seller is getting 95 and the government is getting 10 and the dead weight loss is this triangle in the middle where some of that inefficiency is coming because consumer surplus is lost and some of the inefficiency is coming because producer surplus is lost the key takeaway is that whether the tax is on the buyer or the seller the net effect is the same what about the tax burden if you have a certain amount of tax t the total tax paid is equal to the tax amount t times the quantity so it is the area of this this rectangle over here now who pays more of this tax the buyer or the seller and the answer is that it depends on the steepness of the supply and demand curves we don't need to get into detail here but i'll just give a logical explanation if you talk about a product like cigarettes where the demand curve is very steep you have a demand curve that looks sort of like this a steep demand curve as we'll see in the next segment means that it is an inelastic demand when the demand is inelastic then it turns out that the consumer pays most of the tax bill if the demand is relatively elastic then it turns out that the seller pays most of the tax bill so you need to remember this statement over here the relative tax burden depends on the steepness of the demand and supply curves now i want you to do example 12 where you are given the equation of a demand curve you are given a supply curve and then you are told that there is a given tax and you need to find the impact of the tax after that you need to show that if the tax were on the buyer the overall impact would be the same so to properly understand what i'm talking about here you should do this particular example